Amen. Amen. This particular point in the scriptures in chapter 3 is a pivotal series of verses. And you have to remember uh, the context here when Paul was writing this letter, as you well know, uh, was to rebuke and commend and exhort Christians to live for Christ. Now, remember, part of our lifestyle and our Say so all of our lifestyle is this, that we're to be growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. This is something that God does through every believer's life without exception. And so as a Christian, we should ever be growing and maturing in the things of God. And so Paul's exhortation to these Jews, which many were, and Gentiles as well, was that you know, here's the, here's the fact. We have, at their disposal, they had the Old Testament. And the Old Testament was the way of life for the Jew in their day. They knew very little about this exchanged life that Christ now would give them through His strength, through His power, by grace, through faith in Christ alone. But remember, it was always that way in the Old Testament. However, the church had not been established. And so Paul now is going to reach back to the Old Testament as a pivotal moment here to gather and to attract the attention of many of these Jews and there were a lot of them who were against Paul Paul, because of this new teaching so to speak which is not really a new teaching it's what, it was God's plan ever since the beginning but it was new to them and knowing the fact that so many people now were being born again were being saved and now living this exchanged life and Christ being the sinner, it really left a rock in the shoe of a lot of these Jews because they didn't understand what was happening. The only thing they understood was the Old Testament. Don't give us this New Testament teaching about Jesus Christ. And so now he's going to use the Old Testament as an example. Remember, to refute the Word of God, you must use the Word of God. Interpret the Word of God with the Word of God, and you'll always be on solid foundation. So as a living epistle for Christ, this new covenant that Paul was talking about here in regard to what was God's all was his intention, the new, the new covenant is the abundantly, is abundantly the life-giving covenant covenant okay so again that was God's intention but the old covenant brought death and then the contrast here he's going to use three of them was that the new covenant brings life and I'll prove that to you as he did right here the purpose of the law was to proclaim the ministry of death and that's the phrase he uses which brought death and conviction of sin as we read in verse 7 so again the, he says, now, if the ministry of death, he's referring to something very important that every Jew understood. Notice, carved in letters on stone, he's talking about the Ten Commandments. All Jews knew about the Ten Commandments. They knew all of its origin and how it got started with Moses. So he piques their curiosity, he gets their attention, talks about those stone tablets, and notice he says, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end. John Calvin said this about this verse. The office of the law is shown to us that the disease in such a way of pertaining to sin, a way that, is show, that it shows us no hope of cure. Whereas the office of the gospel is to bring, in the good news, is to bring a remedy to those who are past hope. For the law, since it leaves man to himself, necessarily condemns him to death, whereas the gospel, by bringing him to Christ, opens the gate of the law. Oh, I'm sorry, opens the gate of the light. So the law is that which shows us the disease, shows us there is no hope, and causes us to flee to God for deliverance. Remember, there was an important part behind that law. And so where did all this stuff start? 
concerning you know, this law and, and how God wanted to deal with humanity. And remember, out of all the people on the planet, He chooses the least of all races. He chooses a slave race. And He wants to set them apart for a specific reason. And that specific re reason was this, so that they would be the light to the true living God. That was the whole point. That they too could have a personal relationship with the true living God as being that testimony and example. Now remember when they left, right? Out of Egypt, and now they're at the, uh, the foot of Mount Sinai. So if you would turn, let's just look at some of this evidence here. And I want to show you how this whole dilemma started. Exodus chapter 19, and let's read verse 1 through 14. Now in chapter 20, this is where they get the laws, the Ten Commandments. But chapter 19, beginning in verse 1, let's read all the way to verse 14. It says, Now on the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, and on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set off from Rephim, and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they camped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain while Moses went up to God. The Lord called out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you out to myself. So you can see the, the personal attachment, the intimacy that God included here in this, in this language, that He wanted to have a relationship. Remember, it's God initiating the relationship. It's not the other way around. And so He says that to initiate that relationship with them to Himself, verse 5, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey My voice and keep My covenant, covenant meaning the promise, you, will, you shall be my treasured, notice this, treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the people of Israel. So God gives Moses a directive here, some instructions on what God expects of them. And this is so gracious of God to do that. And so he said, now you tell the people of Israel what I'm saying to you. Verse 7, so Moses came and called the elders. Each tribe had elders, and then there was a total of 70 of them. Twelve tribes, 70 elders. And so Moses came and called the elders of the people and set them, set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded them. All the people answered and said together, Now note this, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. Now you know the word, right? All is 100%. So whatever God said to do, to these elders, and to relay that on to the people of Israel, which we'll get into another chapter here, they said, we will do everything that God asked of us to do. We will obey that. Notice, and Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord, and the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you, and may also believe you forever. When Moses told the words of the people to the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all people, and you shall set limits for the people all around, saying, Take care not to go into the mountain or touch the edge of it, for whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. See, this is God wanting to relate to the people, not on their terms, but on His terms. So you don't go up to the mountain and touch that mountain. You don't even attempt to try to go up that mountain. Why? Because God said, you will certainly die. So, point taken. Now, verse 14, So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people, and they washed their garments, and he said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman. So, again, now God is setting the, the order 
in motion here. The people, the leaders had agreed to the terms of what God was going to impose on them. And they all in unison said, we'll do it. Not a problem. Let's go to chapter 24. So turn over a few pages. And let's begin in verse number 1. Chapter 24, verse 1 through 8. Then he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and the seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but the others shall not come near, and the people shall not come with them. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord, of the Lord and the rules, and all the people answered with one voice, said, Take note, all the words of the Lord has spoken, we will do. So the elders confirmed that. The people of Israel, which was about two million people all in one accord, said, We will do what the Lord has required us to do. So Verse 4, And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar in the foot of the mountain and the twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent the young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in the basin and half of the blood he threw on the chair against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And we will be obedient. So they added a little bit more to it. Not only will they do everything that he said, but then they also confirmed it with another word. And they said, We will be obedient to that. And Moses took the blood. Now remember, this is making a covenant, right? God's making a covenant with Israel. And the Israelites are saying, we will also make a covenant with our God. And we promise God, in the sight of everybody, and in the sight of God, we promise God, we will do everything that is required of us that you have said. That's where the match is strikes the box and the fire gets ignited the minute you say we promise and let me just let me let me give this to the reality here where paul is in the light of a jew a jew understood this concept most heartedly he didn't have a problem with that but the thing that the jews soon found out was this that the israelites found out they couldn't keep those Ten Commandments. It didn't take long. In fact, I think the, the moment that they, the words left their mouth, that they said they would do all what he said to do, they were guilty. They were guilty before that, but it even more intensified the fact that you said you're going to promise to keep those laws now that God was handing down to them. All right, so now look chapter um, chapter 34. You're still in Exodus. You see, t for us as, as Cajuns, we can't fully appreciate the law the way the Jew understood the law in that day, in the Old Testament. But chapter 34, beginning in verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Cut for yourselves two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. Be ready by the morning and come up the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you and let no one be seen throughout the, the, whole, out the, whole, the mountain, all the mountain. Let no flocks or herds graze up opposite that mountain so Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first and he rose up in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hand two tablets of stone the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord the Lord a God merciful and gracious slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness keeping steadfast love for thousands, steadfast love, the grace of God. 
Steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers to the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generations. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth in worship, and he said, If now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the word go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. So right then and there, Moses is convicted by the fact that the people weren't living up to what God had commanded them to do. Why? Because they came in contact with the law. And the law, as he said back in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, is the ministry of death. That's all it means. It's a, listen, nothing wrong with the law, folks. That was Paul's point through the whole New Testament, even now. There's nothing wrong with God's law. Problem is, we can't keep it. So before those of you who may be here, I don't know if we have anyone here today, but if, you, if you're holding to the law like some dear Christians are today, legalizers, they're holding to the law, set of rules and traditions. Remember, with God, it demands, if you're going to keep Him, He demands 100% obedience. 100%. What did James say in 2.10? He says, he says if, if you've broken one, one law, you've broken them all, and you're guilty of all of them. So it's clear. Now, I'd like for you to turn to... Uh, we won't go to the last few verses here, but let's turn to Romans chapter 7. Here Paul paints a beautiful picture, and he uses the illustration of marriage in comparison to the law. And in the, in the beginning of the chapter, he starts to talk about how when, two, when a husband and a wife are married, and one of them dies, okay, in that covenant relationship, it's not a contract, it's a covenant, it's a promise to one another, They'll be faithful to one another, to love one another until death do their part. You, you know the story. But he uses the illustration. It's not about marriage, but he uses the illustration of marriage to make this one point. That when they get married to their, together, husband and wife, there's a contract. It represents the law. And when one of them dies, that person, whoever dies, the one that's still living, is released from the law. You see? Because the law has no more effect on the person who's dead. So he makes that point in the opening chapter. Now, in chapter uh, 7, chapter 7, verse 7, okay, so again, now, we're talking about God's laws, and we've taken the, all of God's laws, but in specific, specific here this morning, the Ten Commandments, he says in verse 7, he says, what shall we say, or what then shall we say, that the law is sin? Because, you know, people fa fail to keep the law. And then he says, by no means. He says, heavens no. Yet if it not been for the law, I would not have known, what? Sin. Now, I'm going to just take a little quick fo footnote to that. Real quick. The fact that a person does not know the Ten Commandments and can't quote one Ten Commandment, does not mean they're off the hook. You follow what I'm saying? Because we use sometimes ignorance as an excuse because I didn't know that that justifies the ends to a means. In other words, I'm saying, well, because I didn't know, then God's going to forgive me. God's going to let me off the hook. God's going to grave on the curve. He's going to wink at me and say, Oh, Tony, look, I know you didn't know the first commandment and all the other nine that followed, but you know what? Since you didn't know, I'm going I'm to let you slide into heaven. Remember, ignorance is no excuse for God. God's law is, is permanent. Now, he also makes a statement, and he says, The fact that you don't know the Ten Commandments or the fact that you don't know any of God's laws, you do have some form of a law. Right? There are some laws. Even though it may not be the Ten Commandments, for instance, you know, uh, speed limit sign. I use that all the time, speed limit sign. That's a law in and of itself, right? Don't raise your hand. But how many of you broke the law on the speed this week? I did with my cart. <laughs> <laughs> or, 
let me put this to you. Let me put, let me, for, for somebody like Dawn, let me put it to you this way. How many of you thought about going faster than the speed limit, even in your mind? Got you. Because you see, even if you thought about it, you're still guilty. In the same way that Jesus said, if a man so much as lusts at a woman, doesn't mean he went to bed with her, but if he so much as lusts at a woman, he said it's just like you went to bed with that person. So I'm guilty all around, regardless whether I'm ignorant to the law or not. I'm still guilty before God. Because the Bible says all have sin, all meaning everyone, all have sin and fall short of the glory of God. In other words, the standard of God's holiness. But you see, those Jews couldn't see that coming. They simply said, well, I'll, I'll obey God just like I do a man. In fact, they got so, they just got so clever at how they did things. They figured, you know what? I'm not going to follow so much the letter of the law. I'm going to come up with these traditions. Maybe I can escape that by outward standards. You see? Oh, see, I give more money than Gurphy. <laughs> oh, I... I'm, I come to services more than Gurfee does, or the other way around. So I'm measuring my relationship with God based on what I do externally, you see. And, that, and of course, that's just how these, uh, these Pharisees were doing, these legalizers. They were basing their religion with God, their relationship with God, on external standards, traditions. That doesn't work either. Because what? They were probably the most hated people in that day. Why? Because they were hypocrites, as Jesus called them. They would tell people to do the things not as they did. And, and as a result, it just continued to, you know, stir up anger in people's hearts. And most importantly, drive them further away from God in which they were supposed to have a relationship with God. But chapter 7 in Romans, listen to what Paul continues to talk about this concerning the law. And he throws this one particular commandment out. And I really believe that's the commandment he had the problem with. And you know what I believe also? I believe it's the commandment everybody's got the problem with. Especially in America. He says, I would have not known what it is to covet if the law had, said, had not said, you shall not covet. You know what it means to covet, right? Desire something that doesn't belong to you, your neighbor, you're looking over the fence and you see that big boat they just bought, and boy, you say, Oh man, I wish I had one like that. Man, I wish I had that car, that truck, that pool, that big boat, man. It's covetousness. Paul is saying that's basically what he had a problem with too. But notice, look what he blames, blames it on. He doesn't say sins, he says sin, the culprit, the noun, sin. He said, But sin, seizing an opportunity, through the commandment. See, the commandment came into play. He said, I would have not known what it meant to covet until the commandment came into play. When the commandment came into play, guess what? That was the fire and the gasoline tank. That's what ignited it. Then he says, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Apart from the law, sin lies dead. So you see that point, right? That's why I use the illustration of marriage. If someone dies... Look at a person in a coffin. The law doesn't apply to them anymore. They're free from the law. The law doesn't apply to them. See, again, there's nothing wrong with the law. The law is perfect. The law is holy. It's from God. It's a divine decree. And yet at the same time, we look at the law as the living and we say, man, it should lead us into this discussion in our mind. Man, I can't keep this. I can't fulfill it. That's the intended point here back in Exodus. Rather than them say, oh, we're going to do it. Come on, man, let's, let's obey what God says. You're kidding me? God's going to set the rules. And let me just say this. Those rules are going to line up with His holiness. Not you. Not your standards. So... Paul says, verse 9, And I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandments came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised, notice, that promised life proved to be death to me. You know, it's like 
people would think the law like a bar of soap. That it's going to clean me. It's cleanse me. No, it won't scrub away. The law won't scrub away your sin. In fact, the law is going to leave you powerless to do anything about it. I'm like that baby there. I'm crying out. I'm saying, God, I'm, I'm an undone man here. I need help. And I, I really believe that should be the focus of every person that hasn't been saved. Because you come into contact with the law. You've got to say, Uncle, you have to. Unless you go on masquerading thinking that all is well and I'll just continue working for my righteousness as the Jew would do. And we do have some denominations today that still are trying to work their way to go to heaven. But verse 11 says, For sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment deceived me and through it killed me. Verse 12, So notice, the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. There's nothing wrong with God's law. problem is the heart of a man. Because he cannot keep the law. The law was there to prove to you that you could not keep it. And so let's go to our next point here concerning this uh, purpose of the law. Well, the purpose of the law, or the, or sorry, I'm sorry, the purpose of the new covenant, that's the, the contrast of it, the gospel was to proclaim the ministry of the Spirit, which, by the way, brings life. That's the flip side. So back in 2 Corinthians. Notice what Paul says in verse 8. He says, Will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? Notice that. Paul's, he's underscoring this, the, the importance of Jesus' gift of the Holy Spirit to the believer. That's you and me. Those of us who are saved. Romans chapter 5, verse 5. He says, And hope does not put us to shame. Why? Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So everyone who's born again, remember in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come and go in a person's life. Now that Christ has come, He has given us the promise, the comforter, someone who's just like Him, the Holy Spirit of God, which does not get much recognition today, but the Holy Spirit resides in every born-again believer. You have to believe that. This is something God does. He places the Holy Spirit in your life who gives life and does not take away life. Verse 18 in Romans chapter 5. He says, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, speaking of Adam, and Adam and Eve, remember what he did, first sin, garden, then that sin carried on through the ages till today. He says, as one trespass led to the condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. Now you knew who that was, right? Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ lived a perfect life. He fulfilled the law 100%. Now that's how, that's how God wanted humanity to live. 100% perfectly. But you see, we failed at it. So before the dawning of time, God had a plan. And that plan was to send His Son in the likeness of men. And Jesus Christ would walk this earth to fulfill every one of the Ten Commandments, plus all the 600 and some other laws from the Talmud to all the Jewish laws. He fulfilled 100% never told a lie. Never cheated, never stole anything, never committed adultery, not even the thought. Fulfilled the law 100% until he was executed on the cross. Even then, he sinned not. He who knew no sin became sin for you and I. And he perfectly qualified for that as the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world. The Holy Spirit, again, 
personifies what Paul is talking here concerning what brings life and what brings death. Well, what brings death? We know the law. But the Spirit of God brings life. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee, in other words, the first deposit of our salvation according to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 through 14. What a beautiful chapter. What a beautiful letter. But let me just read these few verses to you. Just sink, let it sink in here. It says, In Him, that's Jesus, we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined, predestined, in other words, before the foundation of the earth. God had this plan. For those who were going to be saved, He knew. And when they were going to be saved. He says, according to the purpose of Him, that's God, who works all things according to His counsel of His will. Verse 12, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promise of Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee, I like that, the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. You see, that's why I believe in eternal security. That's why I believe when a person gets saved, they're sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. And let me tell you something, there ain't no devil in hell or man going to unseal what God has sealed. So this idea about losing your salvation, and you know, some folks live like they probably, after they're convicted, probably would think that they would lose their salvation after some things they've done as a Christian. But here's the thing, God doesn't renege on a promise, folks. He will never renege on a promise. Paul is making this point concerning a, a new and a better covenant. There's nothing wrong with the old covenant. Remember that. There's nothing wrong with the laws. It had its intended purpose. Now he's initiating this new covenant that was established through the person of Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit solidifies that. Because when a person gets saved, all three are present. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's a great mystery. But yet, without one or the other, you wouldn't be saved. So now, this next point. The new covenant is exceedingly glorious. And I'll explain that to you in just a second. So back in 2 Corinthians, in chapter 3, the old covenant brought condemnation, but the new covenant brings righteousness. Whew. If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, remember what it did, right? It brought conviction to men's heart. It's still glorious. It doesn't change. It's still holy. It's still perfect. How much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? Romans 7, 7. Again, looking at chapter 7 and verse 7 in Romans. Let me read it to you real quick. Paul says, what, shall, what then shall we say? The law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. I would not have known what it is, what it, known what it is to covet. If the law had not said, you shall not covet. Again, nothing wrong with the law. But it never, it's, it's, it was, had never had an intended purpose of you ever achieve, achieving a righteousness. Because remember with God, you must have 100% perfect righteousness in order to enter heaven. And again, some folks think that, they, you know, things that they do and add to their, their uh, resume as far as their acceptance with God, their acceptance with God accepting them, is based on their works. It doesn't work like that. Because when the law comes into focus, you have to understand, it kills And it kills all hopes of ever you ever having enough righteousness. Because just one will separate you from God. So he says in, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9, he says, For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed its glory. So when you think about how God blessed us and how God continues to bless us through the person of Jesus Christ, let's, look, let's just take a look a second here about what he's talking about, this glory. Remember, it was always God's intention 
for humanity to have a relationship with him. But because of sin, it separates us from God. So the laws came into place, and God set the standard. This, these laws were never, in, were never intended for them to be better at their religion. They were just to draw him, them, to the mercies of God. Remember, it, it's, it's a light in and of itself, but if you can compare this in this, in this way. It was a light that would lead people to God. It was a candle to lead people to God, to bring people into a relationship with God, but convicting them of their sin. But just picture this in this, in this context. If you took that same candle and you brought it outside in full sunlight, do you think it would have the same impact in a dark room? In a dark room, you might with one candle. But if you took that same candle and you walked outside in full sunlight, it would have very little impact on the darkness. Why? Because the sun outshines that candle. You get the picture? So when Christ came, Christ is not, he didn't come to do away with the law. It still has an intended purpose, even to this day. But when the sun came, Jesus Christ came, it what? That light drowns out, even though it's still flickering the light that was intended back then for these Jews to live and to know God. Remember, they got saved the same way you get saved today. By grace, through faith in Christ. But you've got to come into contact with the law. See, the law does what? It brings conviction to your life. It tells you that you are undone before God and you need the Savior. You need Jesus Christ, who is the greater light of the gospel. And this is what he's talking about. So, in relationship to the Old Covenant and considering what the New Covenant stands for, under the Old Covenant, God will was made known. However, it made him responsible. It gave him no power to break sin's grip, nor the power to live the life it commanded. So, when I look at the Scriptures, it helps me to understand exactly what God's talking about here. So, when he says in Romans chapter 8, and verse 3... I'll turn there for you. He said, For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh. This exact see, the flesh is too weak to keep the law. So what did he do? He sent Jesus Christ in the likeness of a man to fulfill the one who had the power to fulfill the law's demands. That's why, you know, people today, I, I don't understand. You know, it's, it's this idea of keeping the law. You know, I, I, hope, I hope I'm good enough to go to heaven. But you have to understand, you can never ever be a good enough person to go to heaven without Jesus. You must have his righteousness in order to go to heaven. So under the new covenant, God gives his righteousness and graciously justifies a sinner through Christ's work on the cross. Romans chapter 4. If you read that chapter, you'll find out that's exactly what Abraham had to do. He simply believed God. Remember, he he done some dastardly things too. But in the same way, he had to believe God. And did, what did God do? God credited it to him as righteousness. I love 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You're right there in chapter 3. Turn over a couple of chapters. Chapter 5, verse 21. Notice what the apostle writes here. He says, For our sake he made him, that's Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin. Why? So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, I always use this illustration. In fact, I was using it with a gentleman the other day and talking about how that comes about. Well, let's just say this is Tony, a yellow piece of paper. And I'm going to fold up Tony. Sometimes I feel like that. Fold it up and put away wet. This is me, okay? And this is Christ. And what does God do? When I repented of my sin and trusted in Jesus Christ is my only hope of salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone. God did this. He took old Tony, put me in his son. Now what do you see? 
That's all you see. You don't see me anymore, right? Why? Because I'm in Christ. So the question is, for you, I know that I'm in Christ because of the authority of God's Word and because of the Spirit who bears witness in my heart that I am indeed a believer, a child of living God. Question is, you're either in Adam, which means you're, you see, you're still in your own righteousness, or you have truly repented of your sin and you're in Christ. Now, just let me just throw this in for a footnote. The fact that you're in Christ, you change. There's a difference in your life. The old is gone. Behold, all things become new. So it's synonymous with salvation. Change. Metamorphosis. You have a changed heart. You have a changed nature. Doesn't mean this, like some people would treat cheap, cheap grace. It means, okay, Jesus is going to forgive me. I hear it all the time. Well, Jesus is going to forgive me, but I'm going to go ahead and live like the devil. Well, then you're not in Christ. With an attitude like that, if you're thinking that because, listen, I prayed a prayer, I simply believe what uh, Charles Stanley said on the radio, and I just prayed with Charles Stanley, that doesn't constitute salvation more than that chair can ever be saved. What constitutes salvation? The fact that you're in Christ and you change. Because it's synonymous. You, you know, we want our cake and we want to eat it too, right? The Jews wanted this, they wanted the laws, but at the same time, they wanted other people to abide by the laws, but not them. Those Ten Commandments for all them old pagans out there. No, they intended for you. After all, didn't you say you were going to take up all those laws and you were going to follow them? And what you found out, you couldn't then see pride sets in. We start setting up these little outside religious things. You know, that's so easy to do. People do that all the time. All these little religious things, these little statues, and all these little, you know, traditional things that we do to make them feel like we're so religious. That's what the Jews resorted to. But that'll take you to hell twice faster than anything else. Because that's not how God relates to us. How does He relate to us? He relates to you based on His Son, whether you're in Him or not. Remember, his relationship with his son will never change. So therefore, if I'm in his son, guess what? That'll never change. That's total security. But it doesn't give you license to sin. It doesn't give you the license to say, you know what? I'm saved. I'm in Christ. God's going to forgive me so I can go on and live the kind of life I'm living. No accountability whatsoever. Seriously, what verse and chapter you pulled that out of? Romans 1.17 says, For in the righteousness of God, for in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Now, I'm reading from the English Standard. If you have a King James, it says the just shall live by faith. Luther, Martin Luther had a problem with this verse. Remember who he was, right? He was a monk. He started the Reformation. And so he had that problem as he read that verse and understanding what it truly meant. Because remember, he was under, under a sacramental system, you know, works, sal salvation. Well, he was carrying out all of his requirements that the Augustinians were supposed to carry out in order to be right with God. So they had a cer certain rule. Some of these monks would go up and down these stone staircases till their knees would bleed, thinking that would get them in a closer relationship with God, all based on works, salvation. Or some kind of a sacramental system. That's why he came, that's why he had trouble with his verse. Notice, but he, but he felt that even though he's supposed to carry out in order to be right with God, but he felt that even though he carried them out all out, even though he acted as a monk beyond any other monk, he still had no peace in his heart. This is what he says. Though I lived as a monk without reproach, I felt that I was a sinner before God and an extremely disturbed conscience. I could not believe that he was placated by my satisfaction. Now he means the things that he did. So he's looking at the things that, well, God, that's not enough? He thinks that would satisfy God by doing all these things? Well, he saw there was, a, there was a problem here. And then he says, he says, he says this, he says, I did not love 
In fact, I hated the righteous God who punishes sinners and secretly, if not blasphemously, certainly murmuring great, greatly, I was angry with God. Now, let me just say this. There are people who are angry with God today. You might be sitting here today. And there may be something in your life that will stem back because of your anger with God. And you know how you focus that out? You know, as it comes, you know how it comes out? Because you are angry with God, maybe. Maybe there's one person here that's angry with God. You focus it towards people. And that's how it comes out. The attitude in your mind. You can't get back at God. You can't tell God anything. And you can't demand anything from God. So the next best thing, or the next worst thing, is that you do it towards people. And, and maybe there's someone here that's angry with God, just like Martin Luther was. And he says, at last, by the mercy of God, and that's really what it is, by the mercy of God, meditating day and night, he says, I gave heed to the context of the words in it, that is, in the gospel. The righteousness of God is revealed as it is written, he through who, he who through faith is righteous shall live. That just blew everything out of the water for him. <laughs> you mean, it's so simple, I can't believe it. You mean God accepts simple faith? That's it? Simply believing God in his word? That's what God accepts? So, I mean, that was, this, was so, this was so liberating for him. The fact that he had meditated on this for quite some time. The fact that he had, was living a life that was, in, in most circles, blameless. And trying to achieve his relationship with God and going to heaven. He says, The righteousness of God is revealed by the gospel, namely the passive righteousness which merciful God justifies us by faith. So the righteousness of God is something that I do to please God, but the righteousness of God is not something I do to please God, but the righteousness of God is something given me as I come to Him in faith. I know it's hard for some folks who've been in religion all their lives, especially for the Jews, you know, they, they, they prided themselves on their traditions and they kept the laws and they had all these things given to them. Remember, Israel was going to be that light. And you know, you know who God's using today? The church. In retrospect, the church now. Now God's not through with Israel, by the way. You know, he's not, he didn't write them off. I don't believe in replacement theology, that God replaced Israel with the church. No, God's still going to deal with them in, in the not-too-distant future, prophetically. But for the most part, the Jews believe the same way that you, pagans, and, un un and Gentiles believe. The same way, by grace, through faith, in Christ alone. That's the good news. That's what Luther had trouble with. That's what these Jews had trouble with. Guess what? That's what people today have trouble with. The fact that they, are, they don't feel as though they are sinful enough to receive Jesus Christ. Then he, and he concludes, I'm kind of skipping around here, he concludes with this. He says, Here I felt I was altogether born again and had entered paradise through open gates. You see, it became so real to him, it was as though he was in heaven right now. And you know, that's exactly what God does. When He brings life to you, the, the eyes, your illumination, the eyes, not the physical eyes, but the, the eyes of your heart become illuminated to the things of God. That's why before I was a Christian, I, the Bible, the Bible, what? That's just for Jesus freaks and holy rollers. But then when Christ came into my life, all of a sudden, now this Bible meant so much to me. And I didn't know what, I didn't have anybody to tell me, Tony, you need to start reading your Bible. No, all of a sudden now, why? Because the Spirit of God living in me, wooing my heart to read the Word, to nourish daily on the bread of life, Jesus Christ, who sustains me, 
who gives me life, who gives me hope, who gives me substance every day. I'm not relying on a set of rules, although I love the law. I'm not relying on a, a bunch of ceremonial traditions. Who is my sufficiency for all these things today? Who is the one I put my hope and my trust in today? Jesus Christ. By grace, through faith, and Him alone. The old covenant was a temporal, but now the new covenant is permanent today. Immutable. It'll never change. What God has decreed right here in these last few verses, look at it if you would with me there. We're almost finished. In 2 Corinthians, in chapter 3, verse 10 and 11, Paul says, Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has become to have no glory at all. Remember that illustration I showed you about the candle? Because of the glory that surpasses it. You take the candle, bring in the sunlight right now, it will just, you, it'd be you wouldn't recognize it. It wouldn't give off much light. But it would still be representative of light. Verse 11, For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, in which it did, to concerning the law, much more, will, much more will what is permanent have glory. So, looking at the covenant from the Old Testament perspective, remember, there's nothing wrong with those laws and what God's intentions were. It was holy, perfect, and blameless. God is holy, perfect, and blameless, and His laws are the same way. But when Christ came, the light became even more brighter to the point where it drowns out that little candlelight concerning the law. That's what he's talking about. So when we look at the more, the most important thing concerning the Old Testament and the New Testament, both of them, remember, they're inspired scripture. The Old Testament is reaching to the New Testament and the New Testament is reaching to the Old Testament. That's why Paul would go back to the Old Testament. Because they complement each other. The Bible is never outdated, folks. It's living, it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It can cut between the, the very marrow and the flesh all the way down to the bone, to the marrow. That's how quick and sharp the Word of God is. It's a double-edged sword. Powerful. Now, Paul, Paul used the Old Testament as an illustration. Remember, he reasoned with folks. And the folks he reasoned with were very intellectual. Very intellectual. And many of them, it just went over their head. That's why they wanted to kill him, because they wanted their established religion to remain. They didn't want something permanent. Especially when it came to the things of Jesus Christ. And you remember when Jesus' day, when he walked the earth, he encountered quite a few characters rich, affluent, poor, you name it. He ran across a multitude of folks that had many problems. Some didn't even think they had problems, but yet they wanted to challenge him. And this one particular instance, and with this is where we're going to conclude our message here this morning. I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 19. And we're going to see this character, a rich man. It doesn't give his name. Just a little background. He was probably an influential synagogue person. He probably had some standing in the synagogue and he was very well off like most of the Pharisees were. They never had to worry about inflation. But in chapter 19, in verse 16, let me just read the story to you and I'll make a few comments as we go along. This is concerning a rich young man. Verse 16 says, And behold, a man came up to him, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to inherit, inherit eternal life? Now, Mark talks about the same scenario. And Mark adds to the story, and he says, This rich young man came kneeling before Jesus, bowing before him. That shows respect. It shows reverence for the individual, like many of the teachers in their day. That's how they show that, that influence. But it says, and he also says that he came running up to him. 
Like he was just so anxious to get to Jesus and to, and to just approach him and, and, and just point out some things about his life. And so he did that and he asked a question. He says, teacher, what good deeds must I do? Notice the subject. Eternal life. What must I do to receive eternal life? You don't hear many people asking that question today, do you? Verse 17, and he said to him, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. Uh-oh. <laughs> Here we go. He's coming into contact with the commandments. Remember what the Jews understood about those commandments, right? We're going to do everything that he promised. That God promised, we're going to do everything that he said we promised. We'll do it, God. So Jesus confronted him with the commandments. He's running up to him. He's bowing before him. He calls him a good man. And Jesus said, why do you call me good? In other words, you come to flatter me, didn't you? Jesus knows the hearts of people. You know, I, I, can't, I can't look at the hearts of people, but sometimes I can read people and they come up to me and they say, Oh, Brother Tony, that was such a good sermon. Folks, I don't, listen, thank you for the compliment, but I'm not looking for that. You know what I'm looking for? I'm looking for this. God, I need to change. My sermons mean nothing. What matters? Christ in you. Change in your life. I don't get, listen, <laughs> preachers don't get notches on their belt because you obey God or you don't obey God. I simply just give you the truth. So when you come, which is okay, you come and say, but brother, brother, that was a, yeah, good, sir, spoke to me, you know. What I'm looking for is this are you willing to change? So here he is before divinity. He's before God himself. He's calling him a good teacher. And Jesus said, why are you calling me good? He says, the only one that's good is God himself. You just came to flatter me, didn't you? Verse 18, verse 18, he says, and he said to him, notice, which ones? <laughs> In other words, which one of the commandments should I keep that I haven't already kept? So he's, he's really, boy, he's really patting himself on the back, right? He's thinking, man, he's kept all these commandments. But he's thinking, well, maybe he, he, maybe he knows something I don't know. So I'm just going to just throw it out there. And which one, which one should I keep that I haven't already kept? And Jesus said, well, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not, shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So he noticed he takes the six commandments on top of the first four, right? All those other six commandments relate to what? Uh, to people. Jesus is putting his finger right on his situation. His relationship with people. And so in essence what he's saying is you've broken all these and you can't keep all of these. Notice what the young man says. Verse 20, and the young man said to him, all these have I kept. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> what do I still lack? Oh, you got to be kidding me. You don't think you can get away with that, do you? And Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, why not? He's, real, he's laying on tick, like we say in Cajun land. He's tick, shat. If you be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. He's touching the very hot button thing in his life. In other words, you love yourself and your possessions more than you love anyone else. That's why he told him to go sell everything. Because he knew those things were his God. Those things were the things that he worshipped. And listen to this. They were the very things that enslaved him. Folks, we've got to watch it in America. We've we become so comfortable in America, so lackadaisical in America, and I'm talking about Christians now, to the point where we become so self-sufficient with our stuff and our things in our jobs, in our relationships, that God somewhere is just, it's like, where, where do I have time for God? In 
in all of this stuff. That's basically what he's telling this rich young man. Folks, everyone in America is rich. And he told him, he said, look, here's the problem. You love you and yourself, me, myself, and I, more, and plus all the things that you've achieved and, and obtained, more, and all that stuff, more than you love me. And he slaps him and he says, now go sell everything and come follow me. That's the very last thing on the list. You think I'm going to actually do that? I had a guy told me that one time. He says, do you think, do you think God would accept? He says, I got two houses, I got two motorcycles, I got car, trucks, all paid for, all this property, I got a rent house. He says, do you think God would expect me to go sell all this stuff based on this verse? And you know what I should have said? That's exactly what Jesus told the rich young man. I should have told him that. Because you know what? That's exactly the thing that enslaved him. Because he had all this stuff. He wasn't willing to depart with it. But folks, listen. Do you think God could take that overnight? Go ask all them folks over there in California to just burn up all their property and stuff. Do you, do, you, do you think God couldn't touch something in your life? Illness? Sickness? Do you think God could, could heaven forbid, take away someone closest to you if he wanted to? Just to get your attention? Now, his response was, verse 22, when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He wasn't willing to give it up. And you know, that's exactly, that's our will. See, we, we, we have a free will. We choose whether we want to or not. You chose whether to come to church this morning. You chose whether to open your Bible or not today. You chose whether or not, you know, what you were going to do at the end of the day. You're choosing all these things. But yet what? In the end, who comes first? Is it your spouse? Is it your children? Is it your stuff before God? Like I said, people in America, we got the biggest problems. But yet what? We fail to understand and recognize that. We cling to those things, and at any moment, God could say, you know what? Enough already. I'm just going to just take that from you. And it really doesn't have to take your stuff. You can take your health. You know, you heard it said, you can lose a lot of stuff. But once your health is gone, then what? And if you die today, you know, you're sitting here and looking at me and I'm looking at you, but God's looking in your heart. He's already addressed your heart with the Word of God. Before God who's holy, if you died right now, are you going to spend eternity in heaven with Him? Or do you have an assurance of eternal life? Do you know for sure that you have Christ in you? Because if you don't, you go into eternity. There's no in-between. It's either heaven or hell. And if you stand condemned before God, there's great news. Great news. You can be forgiven. Why? Because God loves you. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believe in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. But there must be something on your part. You have to understand what Isaiah said 750 years before Jesus came. Isaiah 53, 6, he said, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to our own way. And the Lord had laid the iniquity of us all on him. That's God's conviction to you that Jesus Christ went on the cross and took your penalty for sin. Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. How, what must I do? <laughs> what must I do? I find myself in a desperate situation. I'm lost. I'm, God's seen me guilty. He's, con, he's already condemned me because of the law. Romans 10, 9, 10, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. 
For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. All being said here, the fact that you receive Christ, your life changes, you change. It's not just a lip service. It's a transformation. By God's grace, you have a new lift on life, a new leaf on life. All because of what Paul is talking here and talking about and what God has said concerning his relationship and what he wants to do with each and every person individually and the church as a whole is that he wants to manifest his glory in your life so that what? So that others can see the transforming power of what the Holy Spirit and the Word does in your life. It's by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost in your life. Titus 3, 5. God does the work. What you've got to do is surrender and submit to Him. Would you stand please?